Welcome to Quantum Mechanics for the Working Professional. This is a course meant to take folks with a mild technical background through the rudiments of quantum mechanics and quantum computing. I'm Sean, I'm your guide through this material. In our first section, we're going to be covering the main ideas behind a quantum state and quantum mechanics through the lens of the stern gerlach experiment. Specifically, we'll look at what the spin of a particle is, how that spin is related to its magnetic dipole moment, We'll learn how to model the spin of a quantum particle as a two-state or two-level system. And finally, we'll learn how to interpret a quantum state as a probability distribution. As always, this lecture will have an associated write-up uh, that I'll post online and drop the link in the show notes. There you'll find recommendations for further reading as well as a little bit more material. Um, Additionally, I'll include some exercises for you to attempt. I strongly recommend that you do as a way to kind of assess just how well you've absorbed the material we've gone over today. If you haven't registered for the class yet, I strongly recommend that you do. It's free, uh, especially if you need some kind of accountability mechanism to help push you through this material. We can offer that to you, as well as giving you extra tips and tricks and background information for some of the material that we're covering today and, and in the future, as well as letting you know when future lectures drop. So without further ado, let's get started. Particles are things like electrons, protons, or even atoms. And particles spin. It's hard to think of something infinitesimally small spinning, but if you like, the analogy of a baseball, say, spinning, serves pretty well for most of our purposes today. There is a bunch of nuance when it comes to how that analogy falls apart, and we'll get to that eventually. But suffice it to say for now, we have a tiny little thing and it's spinning along an axis. And that axis points out a direction. That's the orientation, if you like, of the particle's spin. Some particles like neutrons and atoms and electrons have also a magnetic field associated to that spin. And what I mean by associated to that spin is that it's aligned with the axis of the spin. It's a dipole field, just like the magnetic field of the Earth in the sense that there's a south pole and a north pole, and the orientation of that magnetic field points from south to north. And like we said, the analogy of a particle's spin to a baseball's spin does break down eventually. One thing that doesn't break down is the fact that the magnetic dipole moment of these particles, that magnetic field, is always aligned or anti-aligned with its spin. Magnetic fields have a tendency to push on one another if you've ever used a compass to navigate on Earth, you're probably aware of that fact that the tiny little magnet inside the compass is influenced by the massive, uh, albeit pretty weak, magnetic field uh, generated by the Earth. If we were to put a bunch of magnetic dipole moments associated to individual particles into a room with a really big magnetic field, all of their spins, all of their magnetic dipole moments would align with that magnetic field. And scientists use this fact all the time to control the orientation of the spins of different particles. So suffice it to say, if you have a really big magnet, you can influence the orientation of individual atoms based on their magnetic dipole moment. Otto Stern and Walter Gerlach used this fact to measure the actual spin orientations of individual atoms, silver atoms, by exposing them to a really big magnetic field. But the outcome of their experiment was a little mysterious. And indeed, it brings us right to the doorstep of quantum theory, so let's describe it in detail. To get a beam of silver atoms, the first thing you do is take a chunk of silver, put it in a metal box, Heat that box up like an oven so that the individual atoms sublimate off of the lump, forming a gas. You can then poke a pinhole in the side of that box, causing the silver atoms to spray out like a nozzle. You can then put a screen with another pinhole next to that hole, creating a collimated beam of individual silver atoms. Coming out of the oven, the individual beam of silver atoms have spins pointing in any which direction. 
Essentially, inside the box, they were randomly distributed anyway. But generically speaking, the beam of atoms is coming out in a uniform, collimated direction, but their spins are pointing in any random direction relative to that beam. In other words, they are a totally unorientated group of atoms, which means that they have a totally unorientated set of magnetic moments. Stern and Gerlach created such a beam of silver atoms and directed it at a large magnet that they designed specifically to deflect these silver atoms based on their magnetic moment. The beam of atoms went directly through the magnetic field and were deflected, eventually landing on a screen where they left a mark, essentially measuring their position, which measures their deflection from the beam, which measures how much they were affected by the magnetic field. This, in turn, effectively measured the orientation of their spin as the atoms entered the magnetic field. If a silver atom approached the magnet with a spin pointed up, it would be kicked further upward, sending it off at an angle above the beam. If the silver atom approached the magnet with a spin pointed down, it would get kicked further downward, sending it off at an angle below the beam line. You might expect a third scenario, where the silver atom's magnetic field, P, was pointed sideways, orthogonal to either of the previous choices, perhaps parallel to the beam line. Classical electrodynamics predicts that such an atom would be undeflected and continue on to hit the screen as if the big magnet weren't even present. The force, in other words, imparted by the magnet was proportional to the angle between the spin of the individual particle and the beam line. By extension, then, all possible intermediate cases would fill in all other possibilities. The distribution of silver atoms was essentially uniform, after all, so that the beam would have fanned out. In other words, from this perspective, the silver atoms would form a vertical line on the screen. But a vertical line was not what Stern and Gerlach observed. Instead, what they found was that the beam of silver atoms split in two. The observational screen, in other words, had only two distinct clusters of silver atoms, one above and one below the beam line. And that is precisely where the analogy between the silver atom and the baseball spinning breaks down. Welcome to quantum mechanics. This observation's a little weird, so it's worth going over it again. The stern gerlach experiment attempted to measure the orientation of the silver atom's spin. Because they came out of an oven, we expected them to be spinning in all kinds of different directions. And therefore, there should be all different types of deflections through the magnetic field, from a little bit up to a lot up and a little bit down to a lot down. But that's not what was observed. There was only two things, two types of deflections observed, up and down. One way to think about this is in terms of information, data. Silver atoms, like other quantum particles, protons and electrons, can only hold so much information about how they are spinning. In fact, they can only hold one bit of information. That is to say, they can tell you up or down. So if you ever ask a silver atom, hey, which way are you spinning? The only answer it can possibly give based on the storage that it has is either up or down. H bar over two minus H bar over two. And hopefully from this perspective, the difference between a quantum particle and something classical like a baseball becomes clear. A baseball is made up of an immense number of atoms. Each one of those atoms can store more and more information about how the baseball is spinning. So of course we can think about it as spinning 20 rotations per second, 50 rotations per second, two rotations per second in various directions. It has more capacity, more storage for that information. A lot of the weirdness associated to quantum mechanics, a lot of the peculiarities that we will meet are associated to the fact that the universe simply doesn't have the information, the information to answer the questions that you're looking to ask. Because two-level systems like the spin of a silver atom or an electron or a proton only can tell you things like up or down, yes or no, true or false, they behave kind of like a bit uh, from information theory, right? A Boolean variable. But because they obey the laws of quantum mechanics, which we will get to shortly, we call them quantum bits or qubits for short.
A two-level system is any physical system with only two possible observable outcomes. The spin of the silver atom is one such example. The spin of many other particles are also two-level systems, like protons, neutrons, and electrons. And as such, we will use the language of spin to talk about such systems more generally. We denote the two mutually exclusive, physically observable states of a two-level system uh, as up and down. Here, we are using the physicist's bracket notation to distinguish from kind of a more familiar vector notation that might, say, be used to characterize some value in a physical three-dimensional space. Like any other vector, we could alternatively write uh, it in a column vector format. So up is given by 1 and 0, and down is given by 0 and 1. These are meant to form an orthonormal basis for our abstract two-dimensional vector space. As we often do with column vectors, we have the associated dual or row vectors up and down, given by 1 and 0, 0 and 1, respectively. And these are specifically designed so we can take the inner or dot product between vectors. We can construct, in other words, the bracket. And it's not hard to see that up with up is given by 1 plus 0 is equal to 1. Similarly, down with down is also equal to 1. But up with down, just like down with up, is equal to 0. They're orthogonal vectors, which you should verify explicitly as an exercise. A generic physical state, say psi, is then a linear combination of up and down states say psi equal to alpha up plus beta down. Here alpha and beta are some constant numbers. This can alternatively be expressed as a column vector, alpha and beta. Modeling a quantum system with a vector was not a choice that we made, it's just a reflection of how the universe works. That quantum state vector, psi, the wave function, if you like, encodes a probability distribution for the set of possible observations or measurements that you can make on that state. For the case of the silver atoms in the stern gerlach experiment, there are two possible observational outcomes, spin up and spin down. And we've parameterized that quantum state, that vector, with two constants, alpha and beta. To see how we can turn psi into a probability distribution, or a probability mass function for you pendants, uh, let's take a look at the mathematics. The probability of observing a two-level system, a silver atom, if you like, in the up state is given by the inner product of up with psi, the state, mod squared divided by the magnitude of that state. In terms of the components, some quick mathematics shows that that's equal to the absolute value of alpha squared divided by the absolute value of alpha squared plus the absolute value of beta squared. It's not hard to see that the probability of observing the atom in the down state or down configuration is given by the absolute value, the mod square, if you like, of beta, divided by alpha mod squared plus beta mod squared. So right away you can see that there's only two possible outcomes, and that the sum of those two probabilities, that is to say the sum of probability up with the sum of probability down, is equal to 1. 100% 1 of the possible outcomes. Notice the presence of the absolute value squared, the modulus squared, um, in the numerator of the probability distribution. That makes things slightly more complex than kind of a standard approach to random variables that you might be familiar with from a class in statistics or probability. But it works in this case, as you've already seen, that the denominator is given by mod alpha squared plus mod beta squared. For the specific case of the stern gerlach experiment, where the silver atoms are coming out of the oven in kind of any which direction, completely randomized, we say that the values of alpha and beta at least have same absolute values or same magnitudes so that the probability of observing 
one silver atom in the up state is the same as the probability of observing one uh, atom in the down state. That is to say, it's a 50-50 chance. This can be arranged, for example, by setting alpha equal to beta. So finally, as an exercise, let's consider stacking multiple observations uh, of atoms against each other. So if you have n silver atoms, what's the likelihood or the probability of observing k of those n atoms in the spin up state, say? I leave it to you as an exercise to prove that this is given by the so-called binomial distribution so that in terms of alpha and beta, we have n choose k times this mess, this relational mess between uh, absolute values of alpha and beta. Note that when you set alpha equal to beta, we get back the standard kind of binomial distribution that you would get, for example, when studying coin flips. For this, we need a perhaps slightly confusing bit of mathematics notation, at least for those of you who have not seen it before. The so-called binomial coefficients are given by the symbol n choose k, which looks kind of like a vector, unfortunately. But what it means, really, is that we have the factor n factorial divided by n minus k quantity factorial divided by k factorial, where k factorial is k times k minus 1 times k minus 2 times k minus 3 times k minus 4 all the way down to, uh, to, to 1. So that, for example, um, 3 factorial is equal to 6. Note that 0 factorial, for whatever reason, is equal to 1. But anyway, I'm sure you've seen this before. A quick way to compute these coefficients is to consider the the binomial x plus 1 quantity to the nth power and then multiply that whole thing out and look at the coefficients in front of each of the terms in that polynomial and assign the coefficient of x to the k <laughs> say to that that property and choose k a little bit of 19th century mathematical culture if you like <laughs> finally i should say that there are exercises on the website that's associated to this lecture, um, you should definitely attempt the exercises. <laughs> the exercises will be considered part of the course, so moving forward we will assume, for example, in section two that you've done the exercises for section one. I'll include some hints and tips for solutions to the exercises as we go along, um, but if you really want to see the solutions, you should really send me a copy of your attempts at them. Okay, cool. That about wraps up our first section. Next time, in section two, we'll learn about physical observables and how they actually act as linear operators on the vectors that represent quantum states. See you then. Bye.